to China now, a country that's been flexing its media muscle, and not just in the news realm. For all of the attention that Hollywood and Bollywood attract, the past two years have produced the three highest grossing movies in China's cinematic history. Wolf Warrior II, Operation Red Sea, and The Wandering Earth have different settings and themes, but they're all action films. And look beyond the gratuitous violence, implausible plot lines, and special effects, and you'll detect some jingoistic themes that are very much in line with President Xi Jinping's brand of national assertiveness. Throw in some government backing, either tacit or financial, and these films take on a very different feel. Cinema has always played a central role in the media strategy of the Communist Party. Are we simply seeing more celluloid-based propaganda revamped for the 21st century, or just a market-based response to the demands of Chinese movie-going audiences? The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the new blockbusters of Chinese cinema. They're blockbuster action films, made in China with a Chinese cast, but almost none of them are actually set in China. Wolf Warrior 2 was released in July 2017. In an unnamed African country, workers in a Chinese factory are taken hostage by mercenaries from Europe. I have told you too many f***ing times that we cannot kill the Chinese. China is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. The action hero is actor and director Wu Jing, who plays an ex-military man. Ah, people like you have always been fair to people like me. Get used to it. With $875 million in box office earnings, Wolf Warrior 2 is not just the highest grossing film ever made or distributed in China. It's the highest grossing non-English language film of all time. Operation Red Sea, which came out in February 2018, is based in a fictional country modeled on Yemen called Yewer. And The Wandering Earth, released in February this year, takes Chinese cinema even further afield. It's a science fiction film set in space. Together, these are the three most commercially successful Chinese films ever released. And they all tell stories of China's growing international power. At the end of uh, Wolf Warrior II, there's a Chinese passport on screen with a slogan, wherever you are in the world, the government as a country is always behind you. So that convey a very strong nationalist message to the audience and something probably unavoidable in a mainstream film released in China. These are different from previous propaganda nationalist movies which came out of the state sector. They have budgets that are large enough to accommodate top actors, good locations and quality special effects. In other words, these are Chinese movies being made on a Hollywood scale about subjects that might have been in the past uh, considered as state-made propagandist subjects. Chinese cinema has come a long way since its days as a mere messaging vehicle for the Communist Party. Films of the 50s and 60s, such as The White-Haired Girl, The Battle on Shanganming Mountain, and The Red Detachment of Women were all aimed at spreading a unifying message, a communist vision to knit a vast, divided country together. By the 1990s, Beijing had shifted from communism to a more market-driven system. Chinese cinema found a new impetus, the possibility of commercial success. Led by the example of movie makers in Hong Kong, filmmakers on the mainland started experimenting with new genres, action movies, period dramas, chick flicks, rom-coms, even satire. It was clear to mainland Chinese producers just how much potential their domestic market had. Having come of age watching Hong Kong cinema in the 80s and 90s, they began to invite filmmakers from there to come over. Hong Kong's film industry offered a model for China. It was diverse, it had stars, and it played with different genres. What's interesting about some of these films is precisely because of the popularity of the people involved, they can push the envelope a little bit. Feng Xiaogang's film Big Shot's Funeral had a lot of comedy revolved around product placement. 
This was a very cynical way of making money by putting large corporations' products into the film. But at the same time, the story of the film was about the corruption of uh, everyday life by advertising and market culture. And Feng Xiaogang's films are full of that kind of uh, rather cynical uh, approach to Chinese culture and life today. Cynicism, satire, critique. Once they get past the censors, they can attract sizable audiences. The 2012 comedy Lost in Thailand made a spectacle of Chinese materialism. Wow. In 2016, The Mermaid, a fantasy romance comedy, pushed an unabashed critique of environmental negligence in China. Both films topped the box office. It's about more than just money, though. There have been occasions when a film can actually make a political difference. 2018's Dying to Survive was based on the true story of one man's mission to smuggle cheap cancer medicine from India into China. It generated such a response that the government was forced to announce new policies on drug pricing. Perhaps inspired or possibly put on notice by the pull of such films, Beijing has doubled down on cinema as a tool for its own purposes. It's resulted in what's called Zhu Suin Lu, or main melody filmmaking, fusing typical Chinese political messaging with the production values, budgets, and mass market appeal of commercial cinema. Main melody films have become even more popular under the current uh, government. Younger generation film viewers didn't go through the previous decades, and it's easier for them to accept this type of films than older generation, say, born in 1960s, 70s. This is also to do with the production quality of those films. In the past, the propaganda films mostly came out of the state-owned studios. The restructuring that took place in 2000, 2001, saw many of those studios disappear, get consolidated, and were frankly overtaken by private sector companies. And then, after a few years of this, we've also seen the state sector learning from what the private sector was doing. As soon as Chinese filmmakers learned how to make films with messages that the Communist Party liked, but with a Hollywood system, movie stars, genres, etc., and the box office then picked up, you, you've got a situation where the Chinese film industry is delivering popular films that at the same time meet the requirements of the party. Superhit films are of growing importance for the Communist Party's media strategy. Last year, the state film and television regulator was abolished and cinema was brought under the control of China's quite forthrightly named propaganda department. And aside from the routine censoring of films, the government has singled out directors, investors and film stars for disciplinary action. The message cannot be missed. No matter how successful Chinese commercial cinema is, Beijing remains the power center, and it will use its labyrinthine set of rules and laws to determine what's allowed and what's not. I think there's very vague what you can do, what you can't do. Some people do something without uh, running into trouble. Some people do the same thing, but they get in, into trouble. And it's also not just based on the current rules, no, but also the current political circumstances, environment, and so on. Instances of content being removed after films are made are reducing in frequency. This doesn't necessarily mean there's more self-censorship. Rather, there's mutual understanding. For example, if I feel there's injustices taking place, things that make us angry or unhappy, I want to shout about them, place them front and center, Instead, you must wrap them up and place your critique in deeper and deeper layers of cinema. There is a paradox in Chinese cinema today. The more audiences Chinese films attract, the more earnings they bring, the closer is the scrutiny they come under from the state. China is ramping up its messaging, not just inside the country, but globally as well. And big-budget films could spur a new age of Chinese soft power. With sequels to Wolf Warrior 2 and Operation Red Sea already underway, 
Chinese filmmakers could find their work being watched much more closely by Beijing than ever before.